Good evening. Were you out and around on the evening of April the 6th? If so, you probably saw a display of Aurora, the Northern Lights, the best seen in England for a long, long time. Of course, Aurora are very common in North Norway, quite common in Scotland, but rather rare over England. So let me show you a few pictures. First of all, from Scotland, Ian Law took these four views, lovely colours there. From Northampton, Kevin Smith, a red Aurora there, the second is. My own neck of the woods, Rob Bullen took that picture, and also this one. And Dave Elman from Bognor Regis, a lovely one there, as you can see. And I like this one particularly, but see the constellation of Draco there. Well, uh, Aurora, when we have the next one, we may not be for a long time. And mind you, many people were on watch that evening, but earlier on, there had been a very spectacular grouping of planets. Look at this picture from Douglas Arnold. There we have the crescent moon. Above it, Saturn. Down to the right, Jupiter. And just to the right of Jupiter, we have Mars. And a picture also from Rob Bullen, showing them all very well. Now, that's called, maybe called, a planetary conjunction. Not really correct, more likely a planetary massing. Of course, the planets weren't really close together in the sky. We're dealing only with a line of sight effects. And that grouping was a precursor to the planetary massing of May when several planets were involved. So let me show you what happens now by using a very modern version of a very old device, an orrery. Our modern computerized orrery, rather lovely thing as you can see. Uh, we have there for the Earth in the middle, the view, and then the Moon colored gray, Mercury colored yellow, Venus in blue, then the Sun in gold, Mars in red, Jupiter blue, and the ring Saturn. And earlier on this year, as you can see, they were not lined up at all. And now, as the months go by, they start to draw together, and by May, they're all roughly in a line, and that is our planetary massing. And orderly is a lovely thing, isn't it? To this stage, I'm glad to be joined again by one of our regular visitors, Dr. John Mason. Welcome back, John. First of all, can we say a bit more about just why these planetary massings occur? Yes, they take place because of a relationship between the uh, orbital periods of the planets, the times they take to go round the sun. And at this stage, I suppose it's worth saying a little bit about the laws of planetary motion. The planets move according to three laws laid down by Johannes Kepler in the early 17th century. The first law says, quite simply, that the planets move around the sun in ellipses. So let's draw an ellipse. Now, for an ellipse, you need two foci. That's these two drawing pins. And we use this loop of string. And as we go around, we can draw the ellipse using those. And there's our ellipse. And this would denote the sun, and the other focus would be empty. So that's the first of Kepler's laws. This, of course, is a much more eccentric ellipse than most of the planetary orbits. The Earth's orbit on the same scale would be very much more near a circle. If I try it, the pins fall out and the paper breaks. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kepler's second law uh, says that the planets move quickest when they're closest to the Sun, the point we call perihelion, and slowest when they're furthest away, aphelion. And if we look at the graphic here, we can see the uh, planet there, perihelion, that's where it's moving quickest. And it's there moving a bit slower and at aphelion slowest of all. And an imaginary line linking the planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times, and the areas of those three triangles would be the same. Now, it's the third of Kepler's laws that's most interesting from the point of view of planetary massings. This law links the time taken for planets to go around the sun, their orbital period p, and their average distance from the sun, which we measure in astronomical units, or AU, the average distance between the Earth and the sun. And that would be a million miles, roughly. 150 million kilometres, yeah. Pepler's law, third law, states quite simply that p squared equals a cubed. Period in years squared is the average distance cubed. And if we take the actual figures for the planets and we plot them on a graph, we get a nice straight line showing us that the orbital period squared is indeed equal to the mean distance cubed. And this allows us, for any of the planets, uh, to know their orbital periods for knowing their mean distances. It really works. It does. Now, for Jupiter, where the uh, average distance from the Sun is just over 5 AU, the orbital period is just under 12 years. 
For Saturn, where the uh, average distance is 9.5 AU, the orbital period is just under 30 years. And Jupiter and Saturn, the two largest planets, are very important in terms of planetary massings because they line up about every 20 years or so. And when they do that, the potential for a planetary massing is then greatest. And I suppose the easiest way to illustrate this is to use a computer simulation. There are lots of programs you can buy for your computer mm -hmm. at home now, which will show you the orbits of the planets and the planets going round and round. Here we see the solar system as viewed from above. The outermost orbit is that of Saturn's, and inside that, the red one, the orbit of Jupiter. And the clock is set at the 1st of January 1940. Now, if we run forwards in time, we can see that Jupiter on the inner track is slowly catching up with Saturn and the inner planets there are whizzing around on their shorter period orbits. And as we come up to the 10th of May 1941, Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus beyond are aligned and we can see that the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, are also aligned. And the view from the Earth on that date shows us all five na naked eye planets are nicely bunched there around the sun, a massing of planets. Now let's run the clock forwards from May 1941 to the early 1960s. Jupiter there on the inner track is now moving well ahead of Saturn, Saturn lagging behind, and we've got to wait until Jupiter has gone all the way round its orbit and has caught up Saturn again for the next chance for a massing of the planets. You can see the inner planets there whizzing around on their much shorter period orbits. Now as we get uh, into the late 1950s, Jupiter is beginning to catch up Saturn. And as we come forward into 1960s, particularly to the 4th of February 1962, Jupiter's just overtaken Saturn. And if we zoom in, we can see that the other planets are all more or less in a grouping. And the view from the Earth on that date, 4th of February 1962, shows us a lovely grouping of all five naked eye planets and the moon there for good measure. And now I'd like to move swiftly on uh, about 20 years from the early 1960s to the 10th of March 1982. And at this time, a Jupiter-led conjunction led to all sorts of dire prophecies about earthquakes, particularly in California. Of course, none of this happened. Of and if we look at it, we can see that it wasn't a particularly good no. planetary alignment in any case. Finally, if we move forward once more from 1982 to the present day, we see Jupiter moving around, catching up Saturn once again. And if we zoom into the inner solar system, we can see that the other uh, inner planets are also in line. And so the view from the Earth on the 4th of May this year shows all five uh, naked eye planets massed there uh, with the new moon in for good measure. Well, of course, not all these massings are equally compact, and way back in the past, there have been some quite spectacular groupings. Yes, and the earliest observations were made by the ancient Chinese. I want to take you back now to northern China at dawn on the 26th of February, 1953 BC, where we have the tightest known grouping of the planets, all five naked eye planets there spread over just 4.3 degrees, less than nine moon diameters, and that's the tightest grouping for 8,000 years between 3,000 BC and 5,000 AD. And the second tightest grouping was 900 years later, 28th of May, 1059 BC, this time in the evening sky. And there we've got all five naked eye planets spanning just six and a half degrees. That's 13 moon diameters. And it's been suggested, not by me, that the star of Bethlehem might have been a planetary conjunction or a planetary massing. What do you think about that one? Well, it's difficult to know because, of course, we don't have a lot of information to go on. There's only the brief description in St. Matthew's Gospel. Uh, something obviously happened between about 8 BC and late 5 BC, and generally 7 to 6 BC is the favoured period. And during that time, Jupiter and Saturn passed particularly close together three times, a rare event known as a triple conjunction. And if we go to February 6 BC, in the evening twilight sky, as seen from Jerusalem, there was another nice grouping of the uh, Moon, Jupiter, Mars and Saturn in the evening sky. And some historians have claimed it was these events that led the wise men to travel from the east, but I'm not so sure. I am totally sceptical about that one. <laughs> and now and then, of course, during the times of 
planetary massings, there have also been eclipses of the sun. Yes, there was a lovely example on the 14th of September, 1186 AD. Here we have the five naked eye planets stretched out over an arc of 11 and a half degrees, the sun a little way away being eclipsed by the moon. And more recently, during your own experience, on the 4th, 5th of February, 1962, a planetary massing we've already mentioned, and at that time, there was a total eclipse of the sun visible from the Pacific region. Where I was. Another point here, John. In 1186, there was a planetary massing, and all kinds of predictions were made. <laughs> floods, storms, earthquakes, you name it. Yes, I mean, this rather set the tone for what was going to happen later on. On the 19th of June, 1385, for example, there were four planets in the planetary grouping. Venus wasn't there, but this didn't stop people making all sorts of dire predictions about a flood of biblical proportions. Of course, they never happened. But I suppose the great famous flood panic was in the years leading up to the 19th of February, 1524. This was a massing of all five naked eye planets and the sun within a 12 and a half degree arc and here the uh, people predicting doom and gloom really went to town and it always amazes me that people tend to forget these predictions when they don't happen and they're always willing to accept another one when it comes along and they're still with us now <laughs> even today John with this planetary massing so let's now take a proper look at um, the possible tidal effects upon our earth well, everyone's familiar with the tides. The tides uh, rise and fall twice per day as the Earth spins underneath the two tidal bulges. And the tidal stress on the Earth caused by the sun, the moon and the planets is proportional to the mass of those bodies divided by the cube of their distance from the Earth. So we can work it out. And if we work out the tidal stresses on the Earth due to all those bodies, we can plot them on a bar chart. And we can see that the moon ha has by far the greatest influence. Uh, the sun has only, on average, about half the influence of the moon. And then Venus and all the other planets have much less of an influence. Venus, the planet that can approach us more closely than any other, has less than one-eighth the influence of the sun when at its closest. And of course, it's worth bearing in mind that the tidal influence varies, particularly with the sun and moon, depending on the distance of those bodies. Greatest when we're closest to the sun and the moon is nearest to us, and at least when we're furthest away. And if we look at the orbit of the moon, we can see there the moon is at its closest, at perigee. And at perigee, the tidal effect of the moon is some 50% greater than it is when it's furthest away at apogee. Now, every lunar month, the highest tides, the so-called spring tides, they occur at full moon and new moon. And if uh, the spring tides occur when the moon is at perigee and when the Earth is nearest the sun at perihelion, then the spring tides are enhanced. And if we look at the tidal stress on the Earth, Due to all the uh, sun, the moon and the planets, we can plot it on a graph and you can see here it varies uh, up and down. And at full moon, uh, the tidal stress was greatest uh, last December, the full moon of December 22nd. You remember people were talking about how bright the moon was that night. Do, yes. Since then, the tidal stress at full moon has been declining. But at new moon, uh, the tidal stress has been increasing. But as you can see, on the 4th of May 2000, during our planetary massing, the tidal stress on the Earth is much less than it was last December and less than many other occasions. So I don't expect anything to happen at all. Neither do I. Well, let's look now at the possible tidal effects on the Sun. Solar tides, storms there, increased activity, effects on the Earth? Well, again, we can look at it. The uh, tidal effect of any planet on the Sun is proportional to the mass of that planet divided by its distance from the Sun cubed. And we can work out the relative tidal forces of the Sun, and we plotted them on this bar chart. You see, Jupiter has the greatest effect, followed by Venus, Mercury, and then the Earth-Moon system. Notice particularly in the case of Jupiter and Mercury, uh, the tidal effect varies quite dramatically between they tend their nearest and furthest from the Sun. Now, if we go back in time, the past 400 years, it turns out that the greatest tidal stress on the Sun was on the 14th of November, 1703. And if we go back and look at our computer model, there's what the solar system looked like on that date. You can see there's a reasonable alignment of the planets. For the greatest tidal stress, you need all the planets more or less in a straight line, although they don't have to be on the same side of the Sun. And there were similar uh, maximums in the tidal stress on the Sun in 1775, 1846, and on, in May 1941. 
And the crucial thing is that in May this year, the tidal stress on the sun will be less than it was on any of those previous occasions. So I don't expect anything to happen. <laughs> Neither do I. Well, let's now go through the sequence of events in this month's planetary, planetary massing. Bearing in mind, of course, you won't actually see it at all because it's too near the sun. Yes, indeed. What we do is to use another one of our computer animations. Uh, this time we've darkened the sky so that you can actually see the planets by removing the glare of the sun. The clock's on the 1st of May, and if we run it forwards in time, we can slowly see the planets uh, changing in position with time. Uh, the moon coming in there, and on the 4th of May, that'll be new moon, uh, it then moves out of the picture. You'll notice that the grouping of planets is slowly becoming tighter, and on the 9th of May, uh, that is when the tidal stress on the sun will be greatest, but as we've already said, there have been many occasions when it's been higher in the past. And then as time goes on towards the 17th of May, the grouping of planets becomes tighter still, although they're never more than 20 degrees from one side to the other. The next thing we will see will be at the very end of May, when the two giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, rise in the east just before dawn. So as it's you, get up, have a look at them, take your cameras out, and try and get a couple of pictures. But by then, of course, the actual massing will be over. And over for some time. What about the next massings, John? Well, of course, Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions occur every 20 years, so Jupiter and Saturn will come back to conjunction in 2020. But there's not a massing at that time because the other planets don't play ball, so to speak. So we have to go on another 20 years to the 8th of September 2040, and if you go out on the evening of that date, you'll see a lovely grouping of the five naked-eye planets and the crescent moon in the evening twilight sky after sunset. And that should be really a lovely sight. I shall look forward to that. And mind you, I will be aged 117. <laughs> but you'll see it, John. Well, I'll be pretty ancient myself, <laughs> Patrick. Well, meanwhile, this can be interesting. And I think our message will be this. Planetary and planetary massings are interesting, they can be spectacular, but they can't actually affect the Earth in any way. So I think our message about that is, don't panic. John, I totally agree. John, thank you very much. Why don't we visit our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash guide night, or of course, CFAX page 620. When I come back next month, I'll be talking about my own pet subject, which is the Moon, and I'll be joined then by Douglas Arnold, will show you how to take your own lunar photographs. So until then, good night.